Ladies and gentlemen, so we have a special treat for you as you enjoy your lunch. In just a moment, we're going to have Deputy Secretary Ashley Teasdale come up and introduce Congressman Duncan and Governor McMaster for a fireside chat. Um, I'm really excited about this, so, so as you enjoy your lunch, please enjoy this fireside chat. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ashley Teasdale and I am honored to serve as South Carolina's Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Um, thank you again to everyone um, for joining here today um, and please um, continue to enjoy your lunch. Um, I'm gonna give a few remarks and then introduce the next session and speakers. So South Carolina's energy resiliency and the emerging technologies that power our growing economy and population are critical for our continued success and long-term competitiveness. This morning, we've heard from a few of our state agencies working together to support our energy infrastructure and industry accessibility, particularly as a function of successful economic development and community growth. Our economic development representatives also shared valuable insights on the modern industry needs driving grid demand in our private sector. As business trends like electric vehicle production and clean manufacturing gain greater momentum throughout the world, it's imperative that South Carolina's energy generation capacity and portfolio be equally responsive to continuous industry growth. And finally, it's exciting to see so many South Carolina-based companies introducing or implementing industry-leading technologies to drive our local energy generation and storage capabilities. This morning's conversations have painted a very broad picture of South Carolina's current capabilities to meet energy demands and the trends intersecting utility and business markets. This afternoon, we look forward to hearing directly from my legislative and utilities leadership to explore strategies to support South Carolina's future investments and demand. So as everyone continues to settle in with their lunch, I am pleased to introduce our next session and speakers. We're honored to welcome our very own Governor Henry McMaster and Congressman Jeff Duncan for a discussion about how state and federal leaders can align to build South Carolina's resilient energy future. After serving in the South Carolina House of Representatives from 2002 to 2010, Congressman Duncan has gone on to serve in multiple caucuses and committees throughout his time in the United States House of Representatives. Currently serving as the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Duncan is known for his passion for America's energy dominance and his vital role in national security and job creation. Congressman Duncan takes a particular interest in the promotion of nuclear energy, believing in its importance, carbon-free component for our energy matrix. Joining Congressman Duncan is Governor Henry McMaster. Since taking office in 2017, South Carolina has seen over $32 billion in capital investments announced, and that's over 80,000 new jobs. In October of 2022, Governor McMaster's Electric Vehicle Summit took a similar approach in uniting policymakers, industry, and state leaders to prioritize South Carolina's electric vehicle manufacturing capabilities, subsequently leading to over $10.3 billion in EV-related capital investments since the fourth quarter of 2022. Gentlemen, thank you both for your leadership in discussing these critical topics to ensure South Carolina's sustainable advantage and competitiveness. Audience, please welcome and joining, join and welcome and Congressman Duncan and Henry McMaster. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Can everybody hear? 
say something. Come I think let's do a mic check. Yeah, we're good. Everybody here okay? Well, we, this has been a delightful thing. I, you know, I, I knew I didn't know much, but I, I realized how little I knew after listening to some of these presentations this morning, and that's what it's all about. And again, it, the, the way to get ahead is through communication, collaboration, and cooperation. So everybody take note of make some new friends and renew some old acquaintances, because that's what makes us go, Congressman, is we, we, could, we can move fast in any direction. We can outrun any other state, I believe. Congressman Duncan, has, as Ashley mentioned, has got quite a policy-making legal career with uh, 2003 to 2011 in the South Carolina House, and then elected in 2010 to the third congressional district. And he has served on all sorts of committees, the Energy and Commerce Committee is his own now, and he's uh, chairing a subcommittee, which is Energy, Climate, and Grid Security, which is just about everything we've been talking about here today. Also, he was on Foreign Affairs, also on Homeland Security, also on Natural Resources, so uh, with all that uh, experience and knowledge uh, in your brain somewhere, I'm tempted to <laughs> remember about uh, the great racehorse Sea Biscuit. I feel like the jockey on Sea Biscuit, who, who decided the thing to do is just turn him loose and let him run. <laughs> so we look forward to hearing from you. And I do have a number of questions here. And the first one is about the, the, uh, the green energy agenda. Uh, it, of course, figures largely in the Biden administration. There are a lot of people in the country that are very, very supportive of it. There are others uh, that aren't, that see problems. And I, I wonder, how, how do you see it? How do your colleagues see it? And what are we going to do to help or hinder? How is it going to affect us? Yeah, well, let, let me first just say thank you for putting on this Energy Summit, and thank all of you for being here. This is probably the most important topic we can talk about in South Carolina right here in June of 2023. And um, my role as energy subcommittee chair on the full energy and commerce committee, you know, I've been neck deep in energy topics really since I got to Congress is a topic I really wanted to work on. And I'm glad to have elevated to a position where I can actually affect policy uh, for our nation and for our state. Um, and I want to just bring a little energy to the topic of energy. You know, we, we've had a lot of panelists up here, but this is a robust topic, something that is so important to me and, and my constituents in our state. And um, when we think about energy, you know, I talk to a lot of my constituents, they think about their transportation fuel costs and what it's costing them at the pump. And they take everything else for granted. They take for granted that the utilities will have the ability to keep their lights on and keep their refrigerator running and, and uh, that the manufacturers will create those jobs that they can go to and they can create whatever widget they're making and that power is always going to be on, but uh, that's not always the case. And then in January, uh, when I guess 2021, when President Biden became president, one of the first actions he took was to really start killing the American fossil fuel industry that we rely on so much. And energy helps make our economy what it is. It helps us grow. It helps meet our uh, municipal and residential growth. And the governor of South Carolina has done a tremendous job, as you've heard, the amount of investment that we've had come into South Carolina. And it's come here because we've had stable energy production, baseload production that they could draw upon. But as we saw on Christmas Eve this year, uh, that was threatened. And after V.C. Sumner project was canceled, we had to really think forward on how South Carolina was going to meet its energy needs beyond five years. And when we attract businesses that need certain components in the energy sector like natural gas, uh, we've got to make sure that it's there. And that's why it's so important to push back against the Biden administration's, uh, you know, really green, rapid, robust green agenda that wants to kill the fossil fuel industry. So um, when I look at and talk with all the utilities and all the stakeholders, natural gas is so important to South Carolina, especially as we think about future baseload generation. So Governor pushing back against the green agenda of the Biden administration and others that want to, you know, make the cost of a new gas fired power plant be almost ineffective. Uh, to allow the environmentalist groups to kill projects like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and almost kill Mount Valley Pipeline, which was so critical to South Carolina and to the southeast by freeing up some available natural gas that we can use here. Um, you know, I was proud to make sure that that language, you know, the reform language that was necessary in the debt ceiling bill uh, to make sure these ener energy projects move forward. So pushing back against the Biden administration agencies like FERC to say, oh, all right, 
we're going to put a shot clock in and put a timeline in for these projects to be permitted so that they can be completed. Uh, we're going to put a paper, uh, paperwork reduction component in there, just make it easier for the, the project developers to actually comply with the agency's requirements within that two years and get the project completed. And, um, and then a lead agency. One federal agency that takes control of the permitting process versus utilities or, po or projects having to go through multiple um, agencies and extra EIS, environmental impact statements and studies. So streamlining the process was very important. And then, of course, the Mount Valley pipeline issue uh, to free up firm gas for South Carolina was, was critical. So um, when we think about energy, we think about transportation fuels, and I like um, electric vehicles, I like wind and solar, and uh, the writing's on the wall with renewable energy. They're going to be a part of our energy matrix and how our utilities balance the load every day with renewables when they come online and when they go offline. In South Carolina, renewable energy is solar. So it starts at zero and ends at zero every day. And when it ends at zero is about a peak time when moms and dads are coming home and they're turning on the air conditioning and the heat, starting to cook dinner for their, their family. Uh, the lights are on for kids to study. You know, we've got to have dispatchable energy when that solar goes to zero. And in South Carolina, nuclear power plays a big part of our baseload generation, but we need that dispatchable to make sure that power can be ramped up on and off uh, when it's needed. So uh, I'd love to talk more about that, but at the end of the day, reliability of of utilities and, and power, uh, affordability, uh, a cleaner, and uh, sustainable. Sustainable means that uh, it's there for the economic growth that we we experience in South Carolina, thanks to your efforts. Well, were, were some of those things addressed in HR 1, which you, uh, you co-sponsored that? Could you give us an uh, idea of the scope and capacity of HR 1? Yes, sir. There was a lot in HR 1 that it was multi-jurisdictional. Some of it came through energy and commerce. Some came through transportation infrastructure, some of it came through natural resources where we looked at offshore uh, development for both wind, solar, and, and, uh, and other fossil fuel generation. But under the energy, energy and commerce component, we ended um, President Biden's war on fracking. We said he can't stop hydraulic fracturing, which actually uh, helps us in the, in the production side of it. We also put language in uh, Dr. Burgess's bill from Texas that uh, streamlined the process uh, where NEPA rules were used by multiple states and multiple state projects to stop them. So we started tightening up the 401 provisions where individual states could stop multi-state projects. Unfortunately, HR 1 got passed to the Senate and Schumer said it's dead on arrival, but it sent the right signal to the marketplace and to our constituents that this is what Republicans believe in when we talk about energy. And HR 1 was called HR 1 for a reason. It was the very first important bill that the United States House of Representatives took up. We dubbed it HR 1 because energy is so important, both to our conference, but also to America. Well, of course, energy is important for everything we, we do here, and often we don't think about how it impacts national security. I know you think about that all the time. What are you thinking these days? Well, I think it was Admiral Mike Mullen that said there is no national security without energy security. And if you look at why the Department of Energy was created, it was to end our dependence on foreign sources of energy. But we're just as dependent today as we were in the past on foreign sources of energy. That's fossil fuel energy, but it's also enriched uranium that comes from Russia. About 20 percent of the nation's enriched uranium comes from Russia, and we shouldn't rely on Russia, just like Eastern Europe shouldn't rely on Russia for natural gas and uh, other energy components. So we've got to onshore domestic manufacturing and production of enriched uranium, whether that's traditional or HALU, that will fuel the future reactors as we move forward in the nuclear realm, making sure those components are there, making sure that the capacitors and the generators as we build out our grid, the mining for the copper, and everything happens here in America so we're not relying on China or any other country in the world for what we need to make our energy sources uh, work here at home. How, how your colleagues, you and your colleagues, what do they see about the, the future of nuclear power? And I know that you were uh, instrumental in working on seeing that nuclear power was included as a clean energy source. Has that been successful? And what is, uh, what is the future of nuclear right now? Well, about 90% of our power in South Carolina, our clean power, carbon-free power, comes from nuclear. About 58% of our power, total power generation is nuclear in South Carolina. We get it. We're a leader. Uh, in the nation for nuclear power generation. But as we look forward, we had a hearing just recently on what the future of nuclear power looks like. We heard from stakeholders there, and I'm really excited about small modular reactors. We heard one of the other panels really talk about that. I don't want to repeat a lot of that, but I'm excited about uh, SMRs becoming part of the power mix because of 
just the, the flexibility of SMRs. Some of it's dispatchable, some of the designs can be, and, uh, but we're still gonna need enrich uranium. We're still gonna need the NRC process to permit these when their components are manufactured in a manufacturing facility and then set up on site wherever that may, at a, a small town, an industrial park, or, or linked together to provide tremendous power for a city. The future is very, very bright for SMRs. We have development projects in this country on SMRs. We also see Ontario and, and even Poland moving forward for uh, SMRs. TVA wants about 20. I don't know how many South County utilities are, are, are looking at and where they're gonna cite those, but I'm gonna tell you the future is bright for SMR technology to provide that power. And, but in the meantime, as we permit those and develop those and, and approve them, we still have to have dispatchable energy to meet our energy baseload mix, and so we've got to have natural gas. That's why, you know, pipeline permitting reform, doing things like Mount Valley Pipeline to free up gas so that our utilities have that gas to make dispatchable energy that's available. And the, the left wants to use it as, dispatch, as a transition fuel, that natural gas is transition fuel. They want to transition to more renewables, but I see it as a transition fuel to SMRs, to when more nuclear technology comes on board. And, and ironically, the left is actually starting to embrace nu nuclear. We have a, I think, a window here in Congress, Governor, to really put forward some good nuclear policy to help advance nuclear reactor uh, actually come online. And we saw Michael Moore just put out a movie. I don't know if it's come out. I've seen the trailer where talking about if we want to meet as a nation our climate emission goals, then nuclear's got to be a big part of that. So that signal to me there is a movement on the left to embrace nuclear. We've got to seize the day and move forward to make it a reality. Okay. We have a few minutes left. We'll open it up for questions. Congressman uh, Ken Nemeth with Southern States Energy Board. How are you? I'm doing good. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. I used you to too. be on that board. You better believe it. Yes. yes. Sir. We miss you. You got a good one. Yeah, we do. Oh, we have a chairman. <laughs> we're, we're excited about that. Um, I want to talk to you about the role of the states in the, the SMR uh, issue. And that is, ever since Eisenhower's speech in 1953 on Adams for Peace, what we've seen is a federal role in the siting and regulation of nuclear in every, in every way. States have not really had a role. And I'm wondering, we have nuclear programs at every, or not every, but at many universities throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. We go all the way through the PhD level. We have people who could run small reactors all over the place. And we can deploy them more quickly uh, if states had primacy in this area. But nobody brings that up. And I think it's time for the states to assert themselves and to have an opportunity to be part of a nuclear future where we can build these plants and we can do it much more quickly because states have primacy and are able to administer those programs instead of going through the, the lumbering process that we've seen both with the Atomic Energy Commission and with, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So I'm interested in your reaction to that. What do you think of a possible role for the states? I think, unfortunately, the Atomic Energy Act put the NRC as the lead uh, regulatory agency. I mean, I met with the NRC commissioner, uh, chairman, this week. We're gonna have them in our committee next week in an oversight hearing. And one thing I told him is that you're not supposed to be an impediment to the development of nuclear in this country. You're supposed to foster that. But yet, 1,400 pages and and uh, just unbelievable regulatory burdens on the utilities that want to bring those online is, is really int untenable. So uh, how can we bring the NRC into the 21st century and once again allow them to be a fostering mechanism versus an impediment? That's quite important. So we're going to talk about that with them next week. The state's role, I think the states can do everything they can, whether it's the General Assembly or the governors, to really try to foster an environment that attracts nuclear. And when I think about South Carolina, I think about Vogel, and as, a, as the Vogel project uh, gets completed and ramped up, and I think about Savannah River site, we've got tremendous amount of intellectual uh, property, so to speak, the people that are involved in the nuclear field that can come and start setting up manufacturing plants and being involved in the SMR, 
SMR projects here. I think South Carolina needs an SMR project. I think I agree with what Gresham Barrett once said years and years ago. The Savannah River site could be an energy hub, an energy campus for all this type development uh, versus just their continuing emissions in the defense and DOE realm. So, um, you know, that's a great site. We just got to have a, a posture and, uh, and, and try to propagate that here in South Carolina. And that's a role of the General Assembly. That's signaling from the governor. That's attracting industry. Because I do think it's a very, very bright future in the SMR technology that's coming. Yeah, it's, it's coming sooner rather than later. Ken, thank you. On that, that point, uh, you mentioned the Savannah River site. Well, over there is the Savannah River National Lab. In South Carolina, just, just recently, uh, some of our legislators are here. We have uh, spent some money or budgeted money for the academic team that will supply the Savannah River National Lab. And it consists of USC, Clemson, South Carolina State, Georgia, and Georgia Tech. And I, I think we just had money in, in the budget. I think 40 million this time and just bid 20 million. If we're on our way to 120 million, so that, I think that's going to open a, a lot of doors, and I think it'll be of, of great interest to, to your point. Uh, I think so. I think in the realm of enriched uranium and possibly reprocessing of what I call a national asset, some people call the waste that sits at 121 sites in 39 states around the nation, that's at nuclear power plants, they consider it waste. But I see it as an asset because it can be reprocessed like other countries do every year, reprocessed and used as a fuel source in reactors. We really have a, a great opportunity, I think, in sites like Savannah River site to approach uh, reprocessing. And uh, that frees up uh, some domestic sourcing of uranium that we can burn in our plants for a very, very, very long time. Well, sir, that was the idea. There are two things. One is the Yucca was supposed to be a disposal uh, site, but that got canceled under the Obama administration. I believe, and then uh, we had the MOX facility that was being built at the Savannah River site, and that was running into budgetary problems. It was there to, to recycle that and use it, as you said. So that's a great idea, and we, we were expecting you to fix all Well, of we're working on reprocessing. We first off have to change the law and get reprocessing as a viability, and then start working on trying to locate where we're going to do it and how to do it, and then get the utilities to buy in to burn that fuel. But France and Finland and other countries are already, the UK are already reprocessing. Japan's working on a reprocessing facility. So I see that as a wave of the future for uh, some of the fuel that we need. Well, we're happy you where you are. No, there's a question there. No hard questions. It's Friday. Hard questions. In fact, I love what you guys are talking about. I love it. Governor Master, this is fantastic. I helped put together, my name is Ben Cross, I used to work at Savannah River National Lab, I now have my own company, and I'm helping what are called integrated energy systems and closed loop manufacturing. I'm helping repurpose the Portsmouth site in Ohio, and maybe the Paducah site after that one. But the Savannah River site, I put together a thing called the U.S. Energy Freedom Center that's talking about the synergistic integration of energy, with nuclear being the main driver behind it. Bill Linton here is a consultant with me. We went around the country and, and, and talked to various different people about the concept. And Jeff... I know you signed the Integrated Energy Systems Act, or, but was a co-sponsor of it as well, with Manchin and the guys from Idaho. Is that, uh, my question is, is that bill going to be moved forward? Because if it is, I think the Savannah Riverside has a tremendous opportunity, or the area around the Savannah Riverside in South Carolina has a great opportunity to really be the leaders in integrating energy systems together and show the, the world how we really should use and produce energy. Well, that's a great idea. And you know, just the hydrogen that comes out of some of the processes there. We talk about hydrogen as a, a potential fuel source as well. Um, but at the end of the day, Governor, talking about the needs of South Carolina, and I love the site and I love future missions there, but at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that, that utilities have the resources available for baseload generation. As you attract industry and more people move to this great state, they've got to make sure that the electricity can be produced, and we do that with natural gas right now, maybe SMRs in the future when they're a reality. So working hard to try to help the utilities have that firm gas that can be used by manufacturing, be used by the utilities for um, baseload generation is critical to the future of this state. we got time. The clock says we're out. I think we have time for one more question. Does anyone have? There's a lady back there. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for this session. Um, my question is about NEPA, 
which is the National Environmental Policy Act. I'm concerned, and I'd like to you to address this, with how that's going to be changed so that we can still participate in the process as citizens to protect the environment. That was created, uh, that, that act was, I believe was created back in the 70s. I mean, we had, right, there, there was a river on fire, remember that? <laughs> Where there was no protection. And I'm wondering how NEPA can be revised so that the public can still have significant in, uh, input to the uh, processes that we're talking about. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so there is a lot of proposals out there. No one wants to do away with NEPA, but uh, NEPA has been, or NEPA uh, rules and regulations have been weaponized by some states that have stopped energy projects from happening, whether that's transmission lines or whether that's pipelines. And so just trying to bring NEPA into the 21st century, we've got a brand new world. We have a renaissance in nuclear power. We have a renaissance in renewable power. And connecting that renewable power to where it can be utilized is important, but NEPA gets involved with transmission lines there, gets involved with the pipelines for the dispatchable energies that we talked about earlier. And so just revisiting things in government, we should never just pass something and never revisit it again, whether it's NEPA or whether it's NRC or, or some other you know, FAA. We should always try to revisit it and make sure that it's modernized and it meets the demands of a growing, robust economy. When I talk about sustainability, sustainability is environmental st sustainability. It's a, about protecting the future for our children, but it's also about economic sustainability. And when I think about energy as a whole, I think about quality of life and standard of living. And we should never do anything that lowers the standard of living of Americans uh, and, and r disrupts their quality of life. And, and one last point I'll make is that we have an abundance of natural gas in this country. We need to produce it, deliver it, utilize it, and then we need to export it because if we really believe and care about people around the, the globe, we can help them take coal-fired power plants offline in Japan, I mean in uh, Vietnam or the Philippines or China, but we also can export natural gas to Africa and help African nations um, have electricity maybe for the first time. It helps with their air quality, it helps with their ability to have windows in their, in their window space and keep mosquitoes out at night, keep food fresh longer, uh, read to their children. And so I told John Kerry, I had a meeting with Secretary Kerry yesterday uh, about the, just all things positive uh, on nuclear and the climate, and it was a robust conversation, and I told him that, and he doesn't disagree with me, but um, they also don't like fossil fuels, and so we're trying to figure out how he balances saying one thing out of one side of his mouth and one thing out of the other. So I'll go back to your question is nobody wants to do away with NEPA. We all believe in the environment and we ought to protect it, but we also ought to modernize it to make sure that it's, uh, it's ready for all the future technologies that are coming on board, whether that's new solar panels or whether that's windmills and all the effects to the environment that windmills are seeming to have or whatever the future technology looks like in the nuclear realm. Yes, ma'am. Public input's in, involved in most any regulation put forward by government. Congressman Jeff Duncan, we appreciate it. It's most informative. Let's uh, show him we appreciate it. Governor, thank you for having me. This has been great. Thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you, guys. All right, we're going to take a quick five-minute break. Um, bathrooms, coffee, <laughs> water, soda, and we'll get back with our legislative panel here momentarily.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you will, find your seats. We're about to start this next panel in just a moment. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll find your seats, please, we're going to go ahead and have the next panel come up. It is uh, the South Carolina General, General Assembly panel. We'll be discussing what laws and incentives need to be passed in order for utilities to invest in new power generation. Um, this is going to be a great panel. I know former Congressman Gresham Barrett said his panel was the best, but I will argue that this is going to be the best panel. Um, not solely because I am now going to be a moderator, but um, we have some, some great, great folks with us. The Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, Representative Nathan Ballantyne, and Senator Tom Davis. So, if y'all will, come on up to the stage. So, as mentioned, um, I will be your moderator now. Um, I'm Sim Singh. I'm the Governor's Director of Budget and Legislative Affairs, so I get the pleasure to work with each one of these fine gentlemen day in and day out. Um, it truly has been a wonderful experience working with all four of them um, over the last five and a half years that I've, five or so years I've been with the Governor's Office. Um, we have a great working relationship. We have communication, collaboration, cooperation, and I think you all see that day in and day out. Um, a successful budget being passed yesterday, and so conference, conference committee, and so, you know, <laughs> moving forward with that. But um, we'll go around now, and I'll let each panelist introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Uh, Thomas Alexander, uh, Senate District 1, uh, all of Oconee and the greater Clemson area of Pickens County and President of the Senate. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the governor hosting and uh, leading this uh, great summit on energy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Merle Smith. I represent Sumter County, District 67 in the House, and I'm Speaker of the House, and if you watch the conference committee, I'm also Speaker of the Senate these days. So, um, I will, I'm I, president. I, yeah, he's president. I, I've, I've rejected that uh, offer to be Speaker of the Senate, but it's an honor to be with you today and look forward to this discussion. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tom Davis. I'm the state senator for District 46, which is Buford and Jasper counties, and I've been in the Senate for 15 years, my 15th year, believe it or not, and I'm chairman of the Senate's Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Nathan Ballantyne. I represent uh, the Chapin and Irmo area here in Richland County, a little bit of Lexington. I've uh, been in office since 2005 and I'm excited to spend some time here with y'all this morning, this afternoon. Excellent. So um, this is, this is going to be a great panel. This is where you get to hear from your lawmakers uh, on exactly what their thoughts are uh, in regards to economic <coughs> development and energy policy for the state of South Carolina. So 
we've got a few good questions. Uh, the first question I have is for you, Mr. President. Um, ultimately, the utilities have the obligation to serve all of their customers within their service territory. If there is residential growth on the system and strong economic development, at some point in time, the utilities need to build more generation. We are hearing stories of it taking two and a half years to even get an approval to build new generation. Delays result in added attorney costs, construction costs, et cetera, all which get passed to the ratepayers. How can we make the process more efficient? Right. Well, I do think that that's, a, that's an important for us to going forward. You, you're talking about, you know, they do have the obligation to serve. Uh, and you, you think about where we are today with the needs of energy and electricity. Uh, we've been the benefactors of those that have come before us to making sure that the grid and the processes work. What we don't want to see, and what I think you <coughs> mentioned, what up to two and a half years that you see it taken to have some things cited, we don't need the regulatory process to be used as a weapon against um, a project that needs to be um, built and engaged. So I think we've got to make sure whether that's through whatever policy from a legislative policy that we have a time frame uh, of when the permits have to be addressed, making sure that we shorten things, understanding that there's a balance there, making sure that the, 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 the needs are met from, from the environment, uh, from the uh, regulatory process, the energy process, the environmental process, but not use that as a mechanism uh, I think what you could see, uh, and also is, is to expedite in other ways, uh, I think if you think about what we did in working with the House and the Speaker on broadband, we could use that as a, as a great example of how we brought the stakeholders together. We found ways that, uh, again, using the governor's uh, collaboration, communication, cooperation, things of those nature, sitting down, okay, how do we, how do we move forward from that standpoint? You've got now, existing right of ways you've got easements and things that are already been determined as a part of the process let's embrace those let's you utilize those expedite from that standpoint because i tell you it is critical for our energy providers to have the capacity going forward to meet the needs of south carolina our residents our industries our businesses across the board you know they are a big economic driver in, in this country, uh, in our state as it is. Most of the IOUs are spending around a billion dollars per year just in maintaining and operating um, their existing system. So, so we, we've got good stakeholders and we will make sure that going forward we have a process that uh, is as timely as possible. I, I know people are excited to hear that from you, Mr. President. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Speaker, I understand you've made economic development and energy reform a priority for the House. Um, you created the Economic Development and Utility Modernization Ad Hoc Committee, which has already generated legislation that the governor has signed into law earlier this year. Looking to next year, could you tell us your legislative priorities as it relates to utility modernization and energy reform? Yeah, thank you for that question because it's an excellent question because we created the ad hoc committee and it was on economic development, but also on utility modernization. And we realized early that those two are interlinked and intertwined with each other and you can't have one without the other. And so, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I always never uh, waste the opportunity to congratulate and thank Governor McMaster for his great job on economic development. You know, it, 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 we have, he's put a focus on this and we've had a number of wins over this past few years and, and the pipeline is still full, right, Mr. Secretary? And, and, Harry, and Harry is doing a wonderful job with his team at Commerce. And so these are good problems for us to have, but the one thing that we've learned through this process is that we are running out of generational capacity right now. And I think everybody knows this and, and you know, it's been the elephant in the room that nobody really wants to discuss but you know, I, I think it's basically become public in my opinion now. And when you go and you talk to companies who are looking at South Carolina, looking at locating, one of the first questions they ask you about when they ask you about your workforce, they're now asking us about what's your ability to generate power in the future? 
and they have some concerns about our capacity because we are not currently in the process of building a new generation here in South Carolina. And you know, I, I think the warning also coupled on our residential uh, customers was this Christmas when we had this freeze, I think people don't understand how close we were to having rolling blackouts at that time. So I think it's time for us to acknowledge that we have this issue and it's time for us to address this issue. And so the one thing that you're going to see is probably in late summer is you'll see Ch uh, Jay West, who's chairing that, sub that special committee, start the process. And as the president just said, this is a process that can't be started by the governor, can't be started by the House, and can't be started by the Senate without the cooperation of all three. And I think that's what's the most important thing. I've had discussions with Senator Davis and with the governor's office is we have to work together. If the House, if we have an ad hoc committee, it just can't be confined to the House. It's got to be in collaboration with the Senate and with the governor so we can find a way forward because it's not, it's, it's too important that we, we make some changes and we move forward with a plan over this next legislative session. And so my goal is that we're gonna have something ready to present the General Assembly that has the approval of the governor, that has the approval of the Senate and the House, but more importantly is built through a stakeholder process. And that's what we've got to have is stakeholders got to come together and they got to realize that they're going to have to give and take. Sometimes in politics, this is a rarity that you see, but you know you have to you have to give and take. And I have a lot of confidence in that. So you know our game plan is, and I think what you're going to see is the Senate, I mean the House, this Utility Modernization Committee, our ad hoc committee, work on the energy reform plan. And it doesn't need to be a plan for 2024. It needs to be a plan for the next 10 years, in my opinion. So uh, we have a, lot, a couple of topics, and, and by no means when I read these topics is this what we're going to do, but these are things that we need to consider as a General Assembly and as your state government of what we can do in this. And i, I just tell you briefly, I have to write them down because there are so many, but you know, obviously we've got the first, we're going to have to invest in our baseload generation. Now what does that look like? That's up for us to come up to do this, but one thing that I know that I think we need to have at least a discussion on is how can we incentivize the more production, or more generation of, en of, of energy, and I think we're gonna have those discussions, and we're gonna have to see, make sure that we meet those future needs, and one of those is as, Senator Al as President Alexander just recommend, uh, discussed, is permitting reform and some reform through this process. We can do a better job and we're gonna work on that. I think we also got to increase clean energy because I can tell you this from someone that's been talking to companies, whether you believe in clean energy or you don't believe in clean energy, that is a demand of industries that are located here. They're gonna demand clean energy and it's not a request, it's a demand. You have to have it. And so how are we going to do it? Can we do it behind the fence? And can we, you know, wh how are we going to handle those? those? That discussion has to occur because people want clean energy. They have committed to this carbon reduction plans and they're not going to be able to do it without a clean energy program. And South Carolina needs to develop one quickly. We also got to do energy efficiency and, and demand side management programs. I, I go back to what they told us when the VC summer project is that we were in a process where we were not going to be able to, you know, demand was, we couldn't reduce demand and we couldn't be more energy efficient and demand was going to grow up and go through and it flattened out at that point in the early 2000s because we are becoming more energy efficient and we need to have a discussion on how we become more energy efficient. Other thing is, is PC, PSC reform. There needs to be some PSC reform. How that works? We're going, we need to have those discussions, but those need to be discussions. Now, I'm not criticizing the current Public Service Commission. I mean, I think they're doing a good job, and they're following what uh, the dictates that came out the General Assembly following uh, the VC Summer legislation that we had. But and we need to make this job more competitive, and I think you have to increase the pay. You, that's just going to be a, well, one of the first and foremost uh, issues that we need to look at. We're going to obviously look at, as, as President Alexander said, regulatory reform. We hear a lot about the, uh, the small modular reactors 
That seems to be the future. We need to have discussions on that. And then we also need to make sure there are elements of competition at this. Particularly, and again, these are not things that I'm saying that we're going to push. These are things that need to be discussed with the stakeholders. I really am impressed with Georgia's policy that, that those high-end users can pick their utility providers because sometimes the territory assigned cannot provide the service for the needs of the industry. And also it gets everybody to sharpen the pencils a little bit. So I, I really would like to have those discussions. Whether it happens or not, I'm, I, you know, we'll, we'll see. But these discussions have to be had. So whether, you know, I, I think what I'm hoping that I'm encouraged by that we see this next year is, is over this off session is at least we're going to have discussions on topics and see what, where we're going with these and at least bring the stakeholders together. And as I say, I cannot emphasize enough that we're going to have to have a product of compromise and my way or the highway is not going to work. And I think, you know, we got a team around here with those of us over here who are interested in this issue. President Alexander has been the LCI committee for uh, chairman for a long time before becoming president. Chairman uh, Davis over here is very interested. I just told him he's the workhorse over uh, this process. We got uh, Chairman Rankin that's also involved and we're working with him and then our leaders, you know, uh, uh, Representative Ballantyne and Jay West and, and Representative Sandifer, we all have got to come together, have these discussions, work in, in, in collaboration with one another and thanks to Governor McMaster's leadership, he has brought a culture of collaboration to, uh, to our government these days and I think it's proven successful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one thing you mentioned, clean energy, uh, and, and I always like to highlight this, you know, clean energy is not just, you know, solar or, or wind. Uh, nuclear uh, is clean energy. It's not always recognized as clean energy across the world, but, but here in South Carolina where we're a nuclear-heavy state, I, I think it's, it's important for us to recognize that as clean energy. Um, going back to the collaboration, communication, cooperation, like President Alexander said, Y'all two are very familiar with bringing folks to the table and, and getting something done for the betterment of South Carolina. And I think folks in this room are excited to, to hear you say that, Mr. Speaker. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'll move on to my next question for, for Chairman Davis. Um, Senator Davis, as chairman of the Senate Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee, what are your thoughts on the state's workforce development needs and how energy policy um, can play a role in addressing them? Yeah, I think workforce development and, and energy policy are sort of symbiotic. Uh, on the one hand, you need to have a workforce uh, with skills that's going to attract industry. And on the other hand, you have to have an energy policy that is going to be receptive to what industry needs. And so, you know, the two are related. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, how, where we go from here and, and how we accomplish the objectives that, that Speaker uh, Smith and, and President Alexander just pointed out, I think a couple points of emphasis. Um, one is uh, look at the last two or three weeks of the legislative session where we went ahead and we completely restructured DHEC, we restructured the way we uh, uh, approach workforce development and we repealed the, the state certificate of need laws. I mean, three extremely heavy lifts. And the way that got done, and, and to, to Speaker Smith's point, was there was collaboration with leadership, with President Alexander, with Speaker Smith, um, Governor McMaster took a hand involved in this at, at the, in the last week. And so I think that's reflected also in what Speaker Smith just read out. That list of things that he just, you know, the litany of, of uh, energy reform uh, discussion topics is the product of some collaboration already between the governor's office and the Senate and the House. And, and so um, these things are going to happen when there is collaboration among those particular branches and also um, that there's collaboration and input from the stakeholders and, and to see the whole board and, and to understand that we have some very competent and professional and excellent utility players on that board. You, you've got Duke Energy, you've got Dominion, you've got Santee Cooper. Uh, within the Santee Cooper universe, you also have Central and the co-ops. Um, so you have very sophisticated, you know, uh, well-intentioned, competent actors in that space. And I think the last couple of years with the Energy Market Reform Committee that I've been co-chairing with uh, Jay West and, and initially with Speaker Smith, we've had those stakeholders at the table. We've heard, you know, input from them. And I think that's important because as legislators, we need to be modest about what our abilities are. We, we need to recognize that we're not experts in this field. Now, we're the ones that have to implement and develop policy, 
um, but we have to be very humble about in terms of learning and listening um, to what the stakeholders have to say. And I would add to that the environmental community, which has a say in this, or the large uh, uh, energy users like a Google or a Nucor or a Central Aluminum. I mean, what are their concerns? And so you, you try to take all those things. It's almost like a Venn diagram. You have these circles out there, and you try to you know, match them up and figure out where the areas of overlap are. Uh, and then you go to the chairman of the committees that, that are going to have jurisdiction, and Senator Rankin is going to have jurisdiction in the Senate, and I assume uh, that Bill Sandifer may have jurisdiction over in the House, and bring them on board. Make sure the governor is on board so that you're not working at cross purposes, because I do think it's critically important that we, we kind of take uh, the reins and set forth a coherent and, 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 and common sense energy plan for the state next session. I, I don't think we can leave next session uh, next May without putting in place what Speaker Smith says is a 10-year plan that clearly maps out the future. Um, I, I share his thoughts in regard to the PSC. Um, I, 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 I don't want to criticize the PSC either. You've got some very competent and hardworking people on there. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you're going to have a comprehensive state energy policy, you're going to have to have a PSC that is strong and competent and able to implement it, particularly if you look to something like all source um, procurement. You're going to have to have a PSC there that's going to be able to be the referee, and having a high degree of competence on that PSC is going to be critical. And I think Speaker Smith is right. It's going to involve, you know, more money, more salaries. I mean, it's just, you know, to get competence, you get what you pay for. So I think that's an important component to this as well. The, the last thing I would say is, we're continuing to have a conversation that really started in 2017 with the VC summer uh, announcement in July when, when that project was abandoned. And, and really, um, Sim, that was for the first time I ever really engaged in how do we go about generating power in South Carolina. I didn't really give it a lot of thought prior to then. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. And we did a deep dive into it. And, and what came out of that was the Energy Freedom Act, where we went ahead and we had a more robust uh, you know, wholesale market. Well, we had instances where if an IPP, an independent power producer, could generate power for less than the avoided cost of the utility, they had the right to sell that power, uh, to have a power purchase agreement that was of sufficient duration so they could access capital markets. And I think by and large that has served us well. So I think that's a continuing conversation about whether or not um, we're best served by the traditional vertical integration where you've got a utility that is involved in generation and distribution transmission or whether or not on the wholesale production side we want to explore further competition among providers in that sector because as, as a philosophical matter um, and this is why I pretty much approach every public policy area that whenever the producers of something have to compete and whenever the consumers of that something have choices you usually get a better product at a lower cost. And, and I apply that same reasoning to the healthcare sector, uh, to education, and I think to energy. Now, that's a point of departure, okay? But once you get involved in the particulars of it, you've got to recognize the realities on the ground. You've got to recognize stakeholders uh, that are in play. You've got to recognize investments that they've already made. So you can't take pure economic theory and apply it, but I think it's important to have a point of departure. So I think that's a conversation we continue to have, and I think that's healthy. That's excellent. Uh, you made some some great points, and I, I think I think folks in this room hearing that and, and hearing what all three of you said, it, it should give them a sense of comfort to, to understand that y'all are already thinking about this. That we're we're looking ahead, we're we're preparing ourselves for the future, and what that may look like for them, so they can start preparing to come answer some questions or give you all some some advice as we move forward through this legislative process. So thank you for that, Chairman Davis. Representative Ballantyne, I understand the ad hoc committee that the, was referenced by the speaker has held several hearings on energy um, to receive input from stakeholders. Could you share with us some of the input you've received, including on the role that re renewable energy will play in the state's future? Sure, Sam. Thank you. Hey, before I do that, I, I just want to make sure, and I know everybody's paying attention, but it's an honor to be up here with these leaders and, and friends, and I want you heard a theme from each and every one of them, and that, that's why they're great leaders, is talk about cooperation and collaboration. You know, too many times in politics, particularly in the past couple of years, it's very divisive. And there are certain groups, whether it's one particular party or another, that it's my way or the highway, and that's ineffective leadership. That will get you nowhere. Uh, it cannot be my way or the highway. You have 124 representatives, you have 46 senators, and you have one governor, so it takes all of us to work together. So t along that point, uh, it was also mentioned that we need to be humble as well. You know, we've got our own paying jobs when we are not representing uh, the people of South Carolina here in Columbia. And we need to know we stay in our lanes, you know, and you heard uh, Senator Davis mention before the VC summer, you know, I was not focused on energy whatsoever. 
but that certainly got my attention. That got my constituents' attention. And I'm a believer that God will take good. Good will come out of bad things, and it certainly has, and it's got us to this point. So I just wanted to to share that uh, uh, regarding the ad hoc committee. It's funny. So I've served on several of those, and uh, every time I'm asked, I'm like, "Look, are we? You know, is this just a dog and pony thing? I don't need any more resume stuffers or any more meetings. You know, are we actually going to do something?" Well, it was the speaker made it absolutely clear that we are going to do something, and we've already done that. You've heard about legislation. You've heard what's coming. And what I like about serving on there with Chairman Jay West is we are, you heard the words uh, shareholders, stakeholders, um, we are listening and we're hearing from everybody. We're not just putting blinders on. Anytime you do public policy, whether, whether it's energy, health care, education, whatever it may be, you can't just listen to one particular group because they're, they're going to tell you what they want you to hear. And you have to look at it from a holistic approach. And that's, that's what we've been doing. We've had several meetings for the past several months. Um, we've had utilities there. Uh, we've had um, economic develop individuals there, of course. Uh, and we've had the environmental advocates. Uh, Y'all know I'm, I'm big on uh, um, clean energy with solar, uh, Tom Davis. We've got four up here from the House and the Senate, but I want y'all to know there are workhorses and there are leaders out there that are willing to champion the cause and to work, but you know what? You're going to have to educate them a little bit. You're going to have to let us know what's important. And what we've heard, I, I jotted down during the several meetings, you know, they, what we're hearing is they need private sector solutions. We hear that a good bit. Let, let, let's listen to the private sector. Um, and one thing that my colleagues, and I'll raise my hand and say I learned as well, is there's a huge difference um, between residential use and the load industrial use uh, when it comes to energy and what we're looking at. And that, that's something that a lot of people didn't understand at first, but now we're starting to grasp that more. Um, and we're realizing that energy is the largest cost in the production process for, uh, for, um, for any, many, many of our industries. And so it's important. We've got to keep that in mind. Um, we keep hearing that we want some flexible, op they want flexible options right there. They want to be able to self-supply. Um, you heard about the Energy Freedom Act that we all worked on. That was huge. We need to make some advances on that. Um, we need to try some new things, and that's what we're doing. It's kind of, you heard nuclear, solar, wind. I mean, it's kind of an all of the above kind of thing. I know that's cliche to say, but um, what we need to do as more, as clean energy matures more and more, the costs are getting much more competitive. And so we certainly need to explore all avenues there. We definitely need to make sure we have a reliable source. I was, I, be, I did not know about the December issue when it's, it was really cold in my house, and when I heard about the possibility and the danger that we were looking at, and I don't know if y'all know all that, I won't get into all that, but that got my attention because we certainly do not want to be like California. We've got a governor and lieutenant governor and a commerce team that are bringing people left and right to our state, and we want to keep that going. So we're listening to them about what they need as far as energy capacity and energy use. Um, two other things that, I, that, that have already been touched on is we've got to look at the permitting process. Uh, again, it's burdensome. You know, we got to make it, granted, we've got certain things in place and we, we need some guardrails in there, just like we do with the regulatory environment that we have, but we, it can't be a burden. You know, we've got to understand that when we up here as policymakers make decisions, the first and foremost thing we need to be keeping in mind is how will it advance our state? How will it improve our economy? How will it bring jobs? How will it be a part of the team that ultimately will improve everybody's uh, way of living here? And uh, lastly, I've got a little conservative uh, conservation side to me. Um, I've been uh, friends with the conservation voters for years, but there's a lot of people throughout this state um, that realize the importance of our natural resource. And I know the governor and lieutenant governor do as well as my colleagues here. And we need to respect that and we need to protect that, the land, the air, the water that we have. And so it's going to be a fine balance. We're going to get it done. You heard the speaker have a, a very thorough list of legislation that's coming. And I know our colleagues in the Senate as well as the House, the governor's office, we will get and continue to do more things to move the state forward. Thank you. Yes, you, you hit on some really good points, and, and I want to jump back real quick um, to one of them where you were talking about all of the above, right? Uh, I love that phrase because I feel like that is South Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. uh, solar, uh, the nuclear, gas, we, we're, we're doing everything we can to move the state forward and provide energy. Um, and, and I want to jump back to uh, Chairman Davis. Chairman Davis and I both had the opportunity yesterday to, to go check out kind of a control room set up on, on how energy works in our state through one utility. And um, it, was, it was pretty eye-opening for me. I, I'm, I'm sure it was for you as well. But to, to kind of see how, and, and most people don't realize, when you turn the lights on in the morning, what it looks like versus when the sun comes out and how the, how the energy fluctuates, it goes to the grid and, and comes off the grid and, and when you turn the lights off at nighttime. Um, so, so Chairman Davis, what are your thoughts on the on the state's current energy mix? Kind of after we, we looked at what we saw yesterday, did that provide you any more um, insight to, to where you want to go in the future and what your thoughts are on the current 
any point. It, it absolutely did, Sam, and it, and it also speaks to the point of needing to be humble and understanding that you need to learn about things. I mean, um, tremendous tour yesterday, and I really thank Keller at, at Dominion uh, for setting that up and taking me into the balancing room and seeing what happens. And, and to that point, up until then, I didn't realize sort of the relationship between natural gas and solar and about how you have to pair them. Um, because as you know, there's cloud cover or as there's rain or as there's an interruption in the solar energy, you can actually see in real time the diminishment of that power source and you have to use natural gas. And then I wonder what, why is natural gas? And it's because you can rapidly accelerate it or decelerate it. So it is a critical balancing component. And so when you talk about dispatchable energy sources like that and, and, and the ability to, to level things out, that is something that notwithstanding the deep dive I've given on this for a couple of years and reading on something, you don't really understand it until you're in that room and you see the interplay of all of that. And, and, and more to the point, uh, the interrelationship between the various territories. I mean, they're, they're in constant communication. You know, Duke's got their territory, Santee Cooper has theirs, Dominion has theirs. And there's that open communication between them. And, and, and also a shout out to, uh, to Noel, who we heard about earlier, who was really the architect behind SEAM. Uh, that is kind of formalizing and, and putting structure around those utilities working with each other in terms of what are their capacity needs and how can they meet shortfalls and things of that nature. But, but seeing that in operation and seeing that in practice makes you a better policymaker, puts you in a position to where you can actually you know, devise and, and talk about some solutions that make sense in the marketplace. So I, I found that meeting today very enlightening. I look forward to having similar ones with Duke and with Santee Cooper and also with the co-ops and with Central. Um, and, and I think as a result of that, we're going to have a good chance of coming up with some good work product. Yeah, it, it, was, it was excellent to see uh, for me as well. I mean, learning something new every day when, when you go in and meet with some of these utilities on, on how energy actually works. We, we don't think about it a lot when we're turning on the lights and, and turning them off. But it, it's really neat to see everything that goes behind, mm -hmm. um, goes on behind the scenes. Um, and speaking of that, so I, I also had the opportunity uh, some time back to go up to Bad Creek, uh, up your way, uh, and look at Hydro. Um, and so, uh, Mr. President, kind of uh, what are your thoughts when we talk about Hydro and some other things um, on the state's energy infrastructure? And um, do you think we have the infrastructure in place uh, that's adequate to meet the needs of the growing population? Well, let me uh, first echo uh, Chairman Davis, uh, you know, that on the ground, like you say, going and seeing firsthand, and like you said, the hydro, I've gone to the um, Oconee nuclear facility that Duke has there uh, uh, and toured those, and it's important to see those firsthand and understand that you've got good base load and solid 24-7 commitments from, from nuclear that is that clean energy. The, all, all the utilities that have been mentioned here have done a good job to this point. But yeah, I mean, I think with the grid and the infrastructure, um, improvements are going to have to be made. I mean, you think about what we're having with uh, electric vehicles coming on. I mean, it's a great time, I think, to be in the energy business uh, because the demand is nothing going to go up. We just got to make sure that we have that infrastructure. It's kind of like the interstate system and having all the off-ramps and on-ramps uh, to be able to, to meet those needs because I agree with you. I think not only turning the lights on, but make sure this air conditioning sure. is running uh, too. So that infrastructure and the grid, uh, and it kind of ties back into to the regulatory reform too, that we got to make sure that we have the ability to expand that grid and expand the infrastructure to meet those needs. And to what the speaker had said earlier too, we got to start planning now for that capacity. I mean, it doesn't get built overnight. And so that's the reason I think this next year is going to be so important for us from that standpoint. But what I do also want to emphasize, we need as much control over the destiny that we have within our own state of what we generate here to make sure that when December's come, we've got the capacity within our state to the best of our ability to meet our needs that we're not having to depend on folks outside of it. And that's a, another critical point of having, as, as the uh, chairman just mentioned, all the utilities talking to each other, working together but they can only do what they have from a capacity standpoint and a grid standpoint. So while they've done a great job, we've got to work and we got to make sure that we're not being impediments to the work that needs to be done for the future of South Carolina. 
you're absolutely right. And um, we heard from Congressman Duncan on how he's how he's working on that on the federal level for us, which is very helpful. And we're lucky to have him in the position that he's in right now. Um, and kind of piggybacking off of what what you just mentioned, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know we've had a, a lot of growth, great economic development in the state, um, and, and you've been heavily involved in that. So kind of give us and give the audience your thoughts on the state's economic development prospects and, and how energy policy can play a role in promoting that continued economic growth in the state. Well, I can tell you a real world example of how it's played and how it's played to the detriment of our state. Um, in Sumter, we had a uh, prospect that came in and, and had a sister facility over nearby uh, there and wanted to, we met with them, had them to dinner and did the initial uh, local team meeting and it was clear that they wanted South Carolina, they wanted to come to Sumter, they had the, the, the spec building was already existed that they wanted and they flew their <coughs> executives in, they were out of country and they came in and they looked at uh, Sumter, they also went to Georgia looked at Georgia and the last thing we heard was South Sumter and South Carolina is going to be where they're going to locate until they saw the energy rates, the difference differential in the energy rates and the power rates. And that's no, uh, by no fault of the utility, I'm not going to name who was who, who was territory it was. It was just purely a result of Georgia right now has lower energy costs uh, than um, in South Carolina. And part of this is, you know, like you mentioned earlier, Senator Davis, is you learn by experience. Part of what I learned in this process is that we probably maybe overcorrected a little bit with the VC summer where we're not giving consideration to economic development rates where other states are. And so that's part of when I talk about PSC reform, that's just a real life example of we need to re you know, recognize that decisions on whether to locate in South Carolina and bring jobs to South Carolina is dependent upon reliable and cost efficient power. And, and we lose sight of that sometimes, and we lost sight of it, I think, when we went through this, through this uh, VC summer uh, recalibration of how we were going to decide energy. And so, again, I don't think, I, I, as I said before, they're so intertwined between economic development and, and utility cost and utility reliability that one's not going to survive without the other. And so we got to recognize that, and that's why I think all of us up here, from the governor, lieutenant governor, all the way down to us in the General Assembly, are ringing the alarm bells. There is no more time for us to wait because the prosperity and the future of South Carolina is dependent upon having reliable, energy efficient, and cheap power. Yeah, I, th I think you're ab absolutely right. I think that's what is going to keep moving our state forward. and. and the amount of prospects coming to the state will continue. Um, we're lucky to have you all. I, I know we're running out of time, but I want one, one quick question for Representative Ballantyne, last question. Um, and, and I want to ask this question because we do have some folks from, from higher ed and, and the tech schools in the audience. And so as chairman of House Ways and Means Subcommittee on, on Higher Education, what are your thoughts on the state's role in promoting energy research and development? and how it can be strengthened, or, or what do you think we should do more of in incentivizing our, our higher ed institutions to play a larger role in, in the energy sector? Yeah, we're, we're definitely gonna need them. I mean, you know, again, like we talked about the collaboration and our universities and colleges can be a big part of that. You know, Sim, in other states, they have what are called energy policy institutes, what you can call it whatever you want. Um, and I think that's something that we need to look at here in our state and you know, determine where we would house that or what it would look like. That's up for discussion, but the main thing is just to have the conversations, again, you heard it earlier, prior to VC Summer, this was not on the radar. Um, it is now on the radar and, and we're running out of time. And so there's not a lot of, there's a lot of lead time that we need to get some things done and we've got to get it done now. We just have to educate the policymakers throughout the state. You know, we formed, there's a South Carolina Energy Car Caucus. It was bipartisan and, and by, it was House and Senate. Um, and we've come together and it's funny, when we were talking to people about it, asking, hey, you want to be a part of it? You know, we heard, I don't know anything about that. And it's like, well, that's why you need to be a part of it. Let's educate it. And so we need to make sure that we get, uh, anytime we're doing policy, we need to get uh, a fact-based information and as unbiased as possible. 
And I think we can do that, uh, again, whether we do that through the universities or colleges or, or follow other states' models. We just have to have the conversations and make sure policymakers are aware of what's going on and that they go there firsthand and don't realize that, hey, you just flipped a light and there it happened. they got to understand what happens behind that and what happens when that light does not come on, what that means for the state and what that means for the jobs we're trying to bring here. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, I, I can't thank you all enough for, for being up here and participating on this panel, and I know it was very informative for, for everyone in the audience. Um, I know y'all have a lot going on, so I just want to say thank you, and um, we appreciate you, and, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sam. Thank, thank you, sir. Job, yeah, thank likewise, you. likewise. Thank you, sir. Always, Always a pleasure. pleasure. You're, uh, great because this is the, this is the this is the follow up plan this is the this is the the, you know, the, the people who actually own the house and own the house and make decisions to try to pull this to move forward so that's you know you, you know so i just announced it yeah yeah i can still do powerpoint i just i just don't have the So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to, to move on to our last panel, um, one that I think you all will find very interesting. Um, it is the power utilities panel. Understanding the type and how much power utilities will need to meet future demand. I think this last panel it, it was put last to kind of culminate everything that we have discussed here today and bring it all together. And, and we're lucky enough to have Ken Nemeth from the Southern States Energy Board uh, which uh, the governor is the chair for the second year in a row. Um, and, and as mentioned, we are going to have the annual meeting in Greenville this year, September 17th through the 19th. Um, it's going to be a very in-depth. It will have great panels, and we invite you all to participate. We'll have more information out on that and make sure we get it to you. Um, but if the panel members want to come on to the stage and we'll get you situated, I'll turn it over to Ken. Right now that we're all in position, we're here to, uh, first of all, to uh, communicate, collaborate, and cooperate, uh, as the governor would say. And this morning, I thought it was very interesting, the governor gave us a history lesson, and I hope everyone remembers that. Uh, he talked about times of want and times of need for the states for the United States of America uh, in the Arab oil embargo of the 70s and we couldn't get gasoline and we had to go from state to state and when we had to do that somehow we had to formulate a thing. Well Southern States Energy Board was intimately involved in that whole idea of getting from one state to another by having even license plates able to buy gasoline Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and odd license plates Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Nobody bought gas on Sunday. So 
Uh, that was a good segue. But then the governor said, well, during COVID, um, you know, we had, that, we had that run on toilet paper. And, uh, and absolutely. I mean, I remember it in Georgia. I remember everybody calling me from, from here to Oklahoma telling me, wow, we just can't buy toilet paper. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The older I get, the faster it goes. <laughs> so with that, we'll, we'll start off a little bit uh, uh, today and, and talk about uh, some things. I had two slides that I wanted to show you. One was a slide of the region, and the other a slide of South Carolina. And it, it, it was showing the balances from 10 years ago to today. So you could see this is a panel on fuels. And so we were going to look at the fuels. But in this setup, uh, we're unable to show the slides. So I'll just kind of, kind of talk through them. And I'll do that um, before I introduce Mike Callahan, president of Duke Energy, South Carolina. Keller Kassam, president of Dominion Energy, South Carolina. Jimmy Staten, President and CEO of Santee Cooper, and Rob Hochstetler, President and CEO, or, or CEO of Central Electric Power Cooperative. So I'd like to set the stage for this panel, which is understanding the type of fuel and how much power utilities will need to meet future uh, demands. The Southern States Energy Board's an interstate compact of 16 states whose members are governors uh, and members of the legislatures, uh, legislative leaders, in fact, and a federal representative who's appointed by the President of the United States. So our focus currently is on uh, testing, demonstrating, and commercializing new energy technologies. As a part of this, we study regional trends. So what fuels were we using in the South in 2010 versus today? And some of the panels discussed this, but I want to make it clear as we begin uh, this session. The starkest contrasts are that natural gas went from 22% of our fuel mix in 2010 to 49% in 2020. Coal was 44% of the region's energy mix in 2010, but only 16% in 2022. So if we look specifically at South Carolina over that time period, investments in nuclear power paid off, and they even increased in efficiencies. As in other southern states, natural gas between 2014 and 2020 doubled. Coal, again, dropped from 36% to 13%. So utility innovations in South Carolina have added to hydroelectric with growth in solar and in bioenergy. So what, what are the future fuels that utilities are planning for in South Carolina? We are seeing the successful advent of electric cars, and that other thing, hydrogen. Are fuel cells or small modular nuclear, nuclear reactors in the mix? We certainly hope so, but we're going to find out about that. During the present and the past uh, fossil energy area, South Carolina has been an energy importing state due to the absence of fossil energy resources. Will South Carolina become an energy producing state in the future? You know, South Carolina, and it shouldn't be lost on all of us in this room, is the second highest wind producing state on the eastern seaboard. What is the potential then for offshore wind? So now to our panel. And I'm going to ask our panel uh, to answer these questions in the order that uh, uh, that they are uh, that I uh, that I propose here, uh, at, because of a deal that I have with Keller. Um, but uh, so Mike, you're going to go first, 
and then Jimmy, and then Rob, and then, and then Keller, uh, as per our agreement, uh, will be uh, the last uh, to answer. And he tells me that after he starts, I won't have to ask any more questions because he'll just roll on for the whole thing. So I think, I think we're going to have a lot of fun here today. Um, so first of all, uh, and we'll start with Mike, please share what your utility brings to South Carolina. Well, thank you for that question, Ken, and thank you for allowing me to go first here. Um, <laughs> I think we bring a lot to South Carolina. Uh, as the South Carolina State President for Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress, we have about 800,000 customers uh, sitting in South Carolina, primarily in the upstate through the PD region of the state. And we provide an economic benefit annually of $7.6 billion to the state of South Carolina. Um, that includes a billion dollars that we invest on our own in capital investments every year, maintaining our plants, investing in connections for new customers, adding generation to the mix. And of course, I think that billion dollars will likely go higher as we have these conversations around the future generation needs that we have within the state. We have deep roots in South Carolina. In fact, 120 year old company, we were founded right here in South Carolina when three visionaries came together to harness the power of the Catawba River and provide low cost power to the burgeoning economy here. And we have some of our most valuable assets sitting right here in South Carolina. You heard that through several of the panels today. Six of our 11 nuclear plants sit here in South Carolina providing that 50 to 60% of our energy mix from nuclear power. I think about uh, on the last panel, they had a brief discussion about our pumped storage hydro facilities. Uh, Bad Creek was specifically mentioned. That's a 1700 megawatt plant. And to put that into perspective, the Robinson nuclear plant that we operate in Hartsville is about 860 megawatts. So a significant, effectively battery that we have sitting there in Oconee County and we have Jocassi, another pump start hydro facility as well, that's about 700 and I think 50 megawatts. So significant valuable assets that we have sitting in South Carolina. That's great. Good afternoon. My name is Jimmy Staten and, uh, and I've been with Santee Cooper for almost 16 months now. And probably the first thing that you'll identify is that I say Santee Cooper wrong. And so Keller, would you help me? Just okay. like it's yeah. spelled. I will tell you, I am working. <laughs> I am working. I'm working on that. Keller is, has become my translator, so that I can uh, I can continue to get better. Uh, I will tell you, it is a it's a joy for us to be in South Carolina. I've had a home in South Carolina for 20 years, but I've never been able to uh, to live here. So I want you to know that uh, that I am grateful for the fact that, it, well, I'm grateful and I apologize that it took us so long to get here, but we're happy to, uh, to be here. So let me talk a little bit about Santee Cooper. We have four pillars at Santee Cooper. Uh, we are a bit unique in that we are a publicly owned utility owned by the state of South Carolina, and so it makes us a little bit um, unique. But those, those four pillars that we focus on is in conjunction with Central and the co-ops in the state, we power a very large swath of South Carolina every day. Um, we, also pro we also energize directly homes and businesses, about 210,000 of those. We're also blessed to be able to hydrate communities in the uh, low country. We, we serve wholesale about 230,000 water companies. And then maybe every bit as important is we focus very hard on ensuring we help South Carolina thrive. Our mission is to improve the lives of South Carolinians, and we live that every day, whether that's providing broadband capability into rural areas or the economic developments that, uh, that Santee Cooper has been a part of over the last many years, um, and we continue to do so in the future. We power South Carolina with about 5,500 megawatts of generation. Um, a large portion of that, almost 60% of that capacity is, uh, is coal-fired generation. We also have um, hydro facilities. We, ha we share a nuclear facility 
with our friends at, uh, at Dominion, and we are in the process of, of going through our first public IRP, and the intent there is to modernize our infrastructure, um, generation infrastructure, and quite frankly, our transmission infrastructure. Um, now, that unique uh, structure that Santee Cooper enjoys has enabled us to provide some of the lowest cost, lowest rates in the state, and we intend to continue to do that as we modernize our infrastructure. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, Jimmy, I've been here nine years, and I think I feel, my wife and I feel a little bit like you're, you and your wife. It took us a while to get here, but man, we are glad we're here, Absolutely. is what I would say. Um, what the co-ops, what Central Electric brings that's special really is the co-op business model. And I am a big believer in the co-op business model. And some of you may not know that the co-ops as a whole serve about a third of the state's population, but we cover about 70% of the land mass. And the co-ops really only have one goal, and that's to serve the communities that they're in and they're part of. And when we say serve, what does that mean? It means providing competitively priced power reliably and in a safe manner. And what really is unique is that we have consumers in every county in the state. So we're looking out for and trying to find economic development opportunities, opportunities to make those communities better in the ways that those communities want, because those communities really own the co-ops. When the co-ops look for opportunities, some of the places that we're looking are the rural places, the suburban places that perhaps don't get a lot of attention. And we're focused, you heard someone mention it today, some of you may know the name, the South Carolina Power Team. That's, the, that's what the co-ops use to do their economic development. All 20 co-ops in the state partner to do that. And we're looking towards each county. What can we do, big or small, for each of those counties? And I would say the uniqueness for us is that cooperative business model of no, nothing more to do than provide competitively priced power, deliver it reliably, deliver it in a safe manner, and for us, if there are profits left over, we don't call them profits, if there's capital left over, it goes back to the community. And that's what makes us a little bit special in the state. You know, we talked a lot about infrastructure, we've talked about generation and all this other type things, but the key ingredient that we have bring to the table is our people. All you need to think, kick out, sleep, you spend more time, okay, with the people at work than you do your family at home that you profess to love. So it's really a quality of life issue. So what we bring to the table are our employees who endeavor 24-7, day and night, to bring the light. And that's what matters, and that's what's important. I take a key from Governor McMaster. He always says when he brings economic development prospects in, they look at South Carolina, they look at our natural resources, they look at everything, but when the deal is closed, it always comes down to our people. And our people are our company, have do it a lot, abandoned of nuclear. They couldn't go in a restaurant to eat. You know, they, you know, they finished up with that. Then we went through the merger with Dominion, came over there and ripped those logos off the side of our bucket trucks. It's like ripping off a whole scab on your, on your leg or your arm. And so we went through all of that. And they never, they never stepped down. They never backed down. They dealt with Hurricane Matthew that came through. They dealt with winter storm packs. They've dealt with everything that has gone on. I was telling Secretary Lightsey the other day, I got a call from Scott Keogh uh, yesterday, matter of fact, and he said, hey, you're going to be our electric supplier for Scout Motors. He said, we're doing it for this reason. He said, we look at two things. We look at price and we look at trust. And he said, I trust y'all that you'll get it done, that your company will get it done, you'll bring the infrastructure and you'll get it in. And what he meant with that, it's not your company, it's your people. So we're going to have a great celebration on Monday when I let all the employees know that they built back the trust by going out there day and night, 24-7, and doing what is ever, ever necessary so when you flip that switch, your power comes on. And that's what you need to think about. And that will be South Carolina's success is our success during COVID. And it'll be our success as we plow forward on this energy strategy to make sure that these all this economic development that's coming in here won't be plugged into an overloaded con extension cord. So it's, yes, yeah, it's about facilities, it's about wire, and it's all this type stuff, but it's about the people of South Carolina and what they do day in and day out. That's what our company's about. So as the, as the South Carolina energy team, how do you drive growth and economic development across the state? What, are, what, are your, uh, what is your planning process and how do you, how do you collaborate on that? 
you know, I think we have a long history of collaborating in the state. Um, I think that motto of communication, collaboration, cooperation really encompasses what South Carolina is. You know, I've, I've heard many times people refer to it as a one phone call type of state. We all know each other, we work together, whether it's in storms, you brought up Matthew, I think about Florence, Michael, a number of hurricanes that we've worked on together. Economic development though, is absolutely a team sport in South Carolina. All of us wanna see South Carolina win. We know the great resources that we can bring to bear on that. You heard earlier, um, you know, we've, we've talked about Scout. The stories I've heard about that, Keller's 60 days end to end. Speed and agility is something that uh, really differentiates South Carolina. I, you know, and I think of it as we compete, but we don't fight. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a good example of that. Um, Rob, Rob and I were talking about this just last evening. Um, we were working together in order to serve Scout. That was an opportunity for, for us to work together to serve Scout. Scout has chosen uh, Dominion. One of the things that Santee Cooper was, was gonna be responsible for, and will still be responsible for, is we have a transmission line that is in the way of being able to, uh, to get the plant sited. And we are in the process on an accelerated basis of moving that. Um, now that Keller has won, it's gonna cost three times as much and it's gonna take twice as long. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. Hey, hey and those same people I talked about, every one of them's got a chainsaw. So. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. My, my, point, my point there is it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who is serving it. Santee Cooper is going to move that pipeline or move that transmission line. Uh, we're going to move it as expeditiously as we can, and we're going to charge the exact same thing that we would have charged ourselves. We work together. We compete, but we don't fight one another. We collaborate together to ensure that we can land and that state can land uh, the growth. We're all going to benefit over the, the long term from that growth. And so I, I really look at that is an opportunity for us to just continue to, uh, to drive success here in South Carolina that the governor has, uh, has generated. It's our job to make sure that it continues. Yeah, and Jim, Jimmy, as we were speaking, um, it really was that fourth C, right? The competitive. We compete with each other, but once the competition's done, and even before, we're, we're communicating, collaborating, and cooperating. Right. And I think even as a state, we're competing with other states. And we have to, we, all of us, make each other better. We have working groups, we're talking about issues, we make each other better um, as we go through the processes of dealing with things, um, EPA rules, uh, dealing with uh, different policies at the federal level. When we cooperate on those things, it just makes the state better. And many of you may know, not know, um, we are uh, Santee Cooper's largest customer. Absolutely. Um, I don't know, we used to be, I know for sure, but sure. Duke Energy One Carolinas, well. um, we, I, we, if we're not the biggest customer, we're in the top couple Absolutely. of Duke Energy Carolinas, and we take transmission service, some of our delivery points are served by Dominion, so we all work together, work well together, and we could rattle off some of the projects, Volvo, Santee Cooper, right. and the cooperatives, uh, Redwood Industries, we talk about that, Hale Goldmine, which was a little known cooperation between Duke and the co-ops, and some of the projects that have come to the state, some of the biggest ones, are all of us working together. And that that's, makes South Carolina special. Yeah, Jonathan Yarborough, who does our economic development, we have a saying that the Department of Commerce and all of the alliances are our customers until the customer becomes our customer. So we really work for them um, in order to bring forward the best deal we can to attract folks to the state. It's all about generations. We've got to have more generations. We about ran out of juice on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It truly, just about ran out of juice. And so it's going to be important that we get that generation going, which is why, Governor McMaster, appreciate your leadership in bringing everybody here today to make this an issue. And I know South Carolina will deal with it. Congressman Jeff Duncan, I mean, he's got the most important energy position in Congress. And he became chairman of that committee, and I always say this with him, get the gavel, he started to travel. And he went around the state, and he's already looked at what are our needs. A lot of people up there wanna say, well, give him a hard time because he voted for the debt, debt ceiling bill. Well, you know why he did it? So he could get Mountain Valley Pipeline done. So Mountain Valley Pipeline can bring gas capacity out of West Virginia into Virginia, which will displace 
natural gas on the interstate pipeline will allow us more opportunity to get it here in South Carolina from that standpoint. So the whole point on economic development is Team South Carolina, as Governor McMaster says, every time coming together in order to close the deal. And we are open for business, but we got to continue to be open for business. And generation is going to be an important aspect of that as we go forward. Renewables are great. Love it. But as Senator Davis, who came to the control room yesterday, he watched that and he watched that solar as those cloud cover came in. Had a little storm come down there around Hampton and Barnville and it socks it in the gut. It drops down immediately. It's an intermittent resource. And what he was able to see is those gas plants at Jasper and Columbia Energy that sit there automatically in sync with it and they track it up when it falls off. And so it's not that one fuel is bad and another fuel is this and you don't want this and you don't want that. Heck, we got 1,100 megawatts of solar on our system. That's one-fifth of our generating capacity. But you know what it was producing on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day when we hit our peak? That's right, Bob Fallen, zero. Not a darn thing. Okay, would you drive a car that wouldn't start when you needed it most? I don't think so. But it's a great resource for us to have because it's cheap, because the sun shines, okay? And, but it's got to be partnered up with something else, as Senator Davis said, and that's going to be our biggest challenge going forward. I'd like to add, if I could, one, one more thing is it's not a foreign concept for us to be working together on everything that, that we do. I mean, the, the communication, collaborate and coordinate, we do it every single day. Um, and I know we, my team at Santee Cooper and at Duke and at, uh, and at Dominion and with Rob, we know what's happening in the state. We share reserves on a regular basis. We know what's up, we know what's down. We know when transmission lines are being impacted because we communicate that every single day, multiple times a day. And when in, in the extreme moments, like, like what you were saying, that's when we truly, that's when our teams come together and truly shine is because we are, we are making sure that that reliable service that we heard about earlier this morning, that our industrial customers expect and that's one of the reasons they come to South Carolina, it's because of that coordination that that happens. That's going to continue. So, okay, so this morning in the first panel, Director Edwards said that we are gonna be retiring nine gigawatts of coal in the next decade. So this question is more, Mike, for you and for Kelly. What are we replacing it with, and where are we going to get it? Yeah, well, for, and I think that nine gigawatts was across multiple states, but uh, I can just tell you that for Duke Energy, as Nanette mentioned this morning, we do operate these utilities across both North and South Carolina, 55,000 square mile service territory, and we have 9,000 megawatts of coal that we will continue to retire over time. I think it's important to uh, recognize we've been doing this really since 2005. Um, we have been on an energy transition for a number of years. You certainly talked about the statistics in terms of the reduction in coal and how gas has come into the mix and increasingly we're seeing renewables. I think we're gonna continue to see that here in the near term, an increase in solar capacity on the system coupled with storage. Uh, I do think you'll continue to see that need for gas. Keller certainly spoke about how well the operating characteristics of gas and solar operate together. And then longer term, Duke Energy is investing in keeping options alive for a number of additional technologies. You heard my colleague, Stephen Capps, talk about small modular reactors. That's something that we likely see in the you know, mid-2030 kind of time frame. Uh, I talked about the Bad Creek Pumped Hydro Storage Facility. We have an opportunity there to double the capacity of that facility. So I think it's gonna be a number of different options. You know, you've heard it today talked about is all the above. I would call it a diverse energy mix. That diversity is something that has served South Carolina well and I think we need to continue that into the future. Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, the next generation mix is gonna be nuclear and it's gonna come, but it's not gonna be here to 2035. And if anybody thinks it's coming earlier, you're kidding yourself. So you gotta make that transition and your transition is with more renewables on your system paired with natural gas. That's what's gonna get you there. That's why Jimmy and I are, are getting together to build a 1,500 to 1,800 megawatt um, plant down at Kennedy's generating station. Why is that so good? Well, all the transmission's already there because it used to be the site of a coal plant. 
So we're not going in and taking up any land whatsoever in South Carolina. It'll be built actually on a smaller footprint right there. You know, less than 50 acres, you can put a gas plant, 600 megawatts, 1,500 megawatts, okay? And, you know, a solar farm, it's going to be what? 600, 700 acres for that same amount of energy, and it's going to be intermittent. I mean, my, my representative from down in Calhoun County, Russell Lott, has seen that. We, you know, if people talk, and I heard people talk about the environmental, we can't lose, and I heard the governor talk about this, we can't lose what is great about South Carolina and attracts people here. And we can't throw away our agricultural base either. And so we need to be making smart decisions, not just what we do with energy, but how we recognize not just our natural resources, but the absolute nature and history of South Carolina and what attracts people here. And I think we need to be ever mindful of that as we go through this process. But Jimmy and I got to get a pipeline, and hopefully that pipeline can be put on our electric transmission to come up there and serve it. Therefore, our footprint is small. But I can assure you that if we don't get that plant, then we're going to sit here for a while and y'all are going to cuss us when y'all sitting in a railroad track and a 110 car coal train is going by. <laughs> because we say you have an inter integrated resource plan and everybody looks at that as the Ten Commandments saying thou shalt, thou shalt. Energy is a dynamic business. We update it every year. Scout, for example, is going to cause us to update ours. Um, being able to get a pipeline permitted could cause us to update it. Can gas help us retire coal? Absolutely. Can we get enough of it to retire coal? I don't know. Can we get it permitted? I don't know that either. Myrtle Beach is growing at 20%. We've been down there trying to put a pipeline in our own right of way in order to increase capacity in the Myrtle Beach, and we've been working on it for three years. I told you all at the beginning, my people are good. Okay, they're real good, and they can get construction done, but they can't overcome the continual lawsuits and dragging us to administrative law judge or an appeals court for over three-year period while people in Myrtle Beach who have a choice. This ain't electricity. They have a choice, and they want that blue flame. Our growth on the electric side is 1.7%. Our growth on the gas side is 3.9%. Constituents in South Carolina like natural gas. I don't care what they ban it in California and New York. They like it in South Carolina. And so the, po the point is, can we pair, not solar and, and mills, but can Jimmy and I get that pipeline done and that plant be our anchor load, and then on top of it we squeeze out a little bit more natural gas so when Secretary Lightsey wants me to go meet with an industrial prospect, I don't have to sit there and say, we can't give you firm gas which is exactly what I had to say to a prospect recently, and they said, well, that may be the fatal pill. So when we talk about electricity, don't forget to factor natural gas into the equation. European companies used to not put, they, they got away from natural gas, right? Then you had a war in Ukraine, and Putin's over there with a wrench on the valve, and they about to freeze to death in the winter. They're embracing gas again. So just remember that when you put it in the mix, don't forget about natural gas. I, I, came, I came to South Carolina after running a pipeline in Kentucky for, for, uh, for five years, and I've never been able to understand this, this pain about adding pipeline infrastructure. That, that in my view, that is a no regrets decision because even if, even if we, we move away from natural gas, it's going to move hydrogen. Um, if it doesn't move hydrogen, then with carbon capture, we're going to have to have pipeline infrastructure to move that carbon out of the state because we need flexible resources in South Carolina. And so, again, we can, de we can debate whether it's a fossil fuel for a lifetime, but it's not. It's an infrastructure that we will be able to utilize for decades to come. So I think it's, a, it's, it's going to happen. Keller and I are going to make it happen. Before we get to diversification, uh, Rob, so let's say Dominion and Santee Cooper get together and they build this plant. Is a growth strategy for you to be a part of that or to participate in some way? I mean, what, what do you think in terms of future growth? Yeah, Ken, to pull, pull what they said together, as Keller said, we are continuously planning. And part of our long-term plan has been, been to participate in an in-state new build. But the co-ops don't build. And so as Dominion and Santee Cooper are talking about a plant, we are prioritizing being part of those discussions, being a consumer. And we're hopeful that when the time is right, that they'll call us and say, it's time to talk. Um, we think that will happen. But another piece for all of us in the room, and I'll say it on their behalf, 
um, this isn't just Dominion and Santee Cooper. It's all, to get this done, it's going to take all of us. It takes the policymakers. It takes the governor. Um, it takes the advocates, the policy advocates in the room. And that is one of the things that makes South Carolina so special um, is that we all come together. And, and I've seen it a few times now when issues come up that we get the policymakers. It all starts with the governor, the policymakers, the legislators, um, the policy advocates, the utilities in a room to solve problems. And so, yes, we are hopeful to be part of that in-state new build, but we are supportive of anyone who wants to build in the state. And I think that puts us in a special spot. And again, I would tell both of them, we're prioritizing those discussions. And when the time is right, um, we believe they'll call and talk to us because it's good for the whole state to get the efficiency of working together. Okay, so let's get into the whole diversification question now. We don't have coal, we don't have oil, and we don't have gas, but, or we're getting gas, but we've got to get it from somebody else. So as this scenario develops over time, what is the diversification plan? And when I say that, I mean, you guys are part of the regional hydrogen hub for the South. Uh, your companies are heavily involved in the, in the whole process. What is the role for hydrogen in the future? Where, where do you see it playing a role? Uh, will, it, will it not be in generation? Will it be in, will it be in, uh, in industrialization in some way? Uh, how will you cooperate with it? How will you work with it and bring it in as a new fuel uh, that can be something else that South Carolina can use and can develop? So. You want me to start with that one? Um, the large-scale utilization of hydrogen um, is perhaps a ways off. And if that is, if the economy is going to become hydrogen-based, again, it takes that collaboration of everyone moving that direction. But there are some options. There's an option to use it as a fuel. Um, it can be stored. The question becomes, can you produce it efficiently? Can you produce it in an environmentally acceptable manner? And as the utilization continues to increase, just like we see with so many other products, um, commodities, the cost will come down. The ability to produce that in an environmentally acceptable, environmentally responsible manner will get better and better. And um, not to steal his thunder, but I think we as utilities are investing in working with schools. I don't know if you're going to talk about that, Mike. Um, but I think hydrogen will play a role, but the large-scale utilization to me is a ways off. And that's where natural gas continues to be that, we've heard it a couple times today, continues to be that bridge fuel that gets us to where if it's hydrogen we're going after, the small scale nuclear reactors, we've got to get a bridge to where those can really participate in our economy. Yeah, I, I agree with Rob on that. Um, and as I mentioned previously, we're trying to keep our options alive and hydrogen is certainly one of those. There's opportunities to potentially co-blend with some of our facilities. And I think as we think about future natural gas plants, you're likely gonna see those configured in a way that they could operate on hydrogen in the future. But it is early days. Um, we do have a hydrogen hub concept that certainly Dominion's a partner on that, Southern Company, TVA, and we're working with universities like Clemson to really try to advance this and see whether there's an opportunity to include that in the uh, generation mix going forward. As I mentioned, that diversity in the generation mix, I think, will be key. Mm -hmm. I, I think my my view is hydrogen is going to have to be a uh, a part of the a part of the solution for us to be able to co burn with uh, with natural gas. Prices obviously have to come down. I think they will, but I think from a policy perspective, we shouldn't get caught up in the color of the hydrogen. Um, there's a very there's a very strong focus today on it has to be green hydrogen. Green hydrogen right now is about six times the cost of what natural gas is. Um, brown hydrogen, gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, those prices are a little bit different. Blue hydrogen is about three times the uh, cost of natural gas. And so the ability to bring that down and to utilize the, the wonderful natural gas resources we have in the state and the infrastructure and convert that to hydrogen extract the carbon, dispose of the carbon, and use that to generate electricity, I think it makes a lot of sense if we can get those costs down to reasonable levels. Okay, so you've got to produce hydrogen, you've got to transport it, you've got to disseminate it, you've got to store it, 
and then you've got to utilize it. And so those are the five steps that you have to go through. By the way, Southern States Energy Board is part of the, the Southeast <laughs> Regional <laughs> Hub, too. I just want to <clears throat> mention that. That pitch uh, But uh, and I think it's I think that's very important. And what I want to know from you all is so where where are we going to produce it? What you know, any plans for that? Any thoughts about, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some uh, plans about transporting it in various ways and, uh, you know, potential pipelines and all those kind of things. But I want to I want to hear your thoughts. Well, there's a there's a six Thank factor. You, you know what the six factor is? finding somebody who wants to store that stuff next to the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's always about where you site it. It's expensive. Right now, the best thing it can be used for is transportation. Port facility, fleet, something along those lines where somebody's got a green initiative and they want to use it there, but it's expensive. Um, I think you'll have SMRs before you'll start really utilizing it from an industrial and commercial in power plants. I mean, we're putting in some peak turbines right now that are that are GE and they have the ability to burn hydrogen. We got no plans to put hydrogen in it because it's cost too much money to get it in that form to be able to do it. And if Secretary Lightsey wants us to have rates that we can compete with, then the input of the energy has got to be cheap. Look that. And it just doesn't compete right now from that standpoint. It'd be ludicrous. Rob? You know, I, I agree with Keller. Um, as I mentioned, I think that we're years away here, but I think that that's why the hydrogen hub concept is going to be an important part of this dialogue to figure out what the end uses are. I do agree, transportation, I've heard many of our customers talk about that as a potential opportunity. I think there can be some industrial uses, and I mentioned the potential for co-blending in our natural gas fire facilities over the longer term. And, the, and dis distribution is going to matter here. Um, right now, DOE is looking at regional hubs around the, the country to shorten the distance for transportation. Um, if you're going to do it differently, um, then you're going to, if you're going to transport at long distances, then you're going to have to do something. Hydrogen is a very small molecule, and so it's very hard to compress. You're probably going to have to go with something, you're going to have to combine it for like into ammonia or something like that to be able to get it to the locations where you need it. So it, it depends on how this entire infrastructure gets built over the next decade or so. I think it's important to think about that yeah. because yeah. South Carolina has been very adept at using fuels that, like nuclear, I mean, nuclear came in in the 60s and 70s and immediately South Carolina was right at the top. And so, and you knew you had to be there this is another one. It's out there, and it's, it's a possibility. Uh, and if we make it more of a priority, uh, we may be able to use it in a, in a lot of different ways. I want to uh, just switch for a minute to uh, decarbonization. We've got 18 coal plants. We've got, or, or we've got 11 coal plants and 18 natural gas plants. And the future tells us, at least uh, the almighty Environmental Protection Agency tells us that we're going to have to do carbon capture and storage uh, on that. Now, we happen to, know, have, happen to know a lot about that at Southern States Energy Board because we do it across the South. But what are your plans here uh, thinking about the future and having to accommodate those EPA rules in the future in order to keep your plants open and, and running. And we've got a big investment here in natural gas. So that's the future. If that's the future, we're gonna to have to look at carbon capture as well. Right. How's that all gonna happen? Well, first of all, I think going back to the collaboration, we're all talking with each other about what are the impacts of this gonna be, right? The rule, the EPA uh, proposed rule, I should say, because it's not a final rule, just came out, comments are due, I think July 24th, and I know there's been requests to extend the deadline on that. Um, but we're still modeling what we believe the impacts of this will be. It's a you know several hundred page bill. There's legal interpretation that's gonna come into play. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that if we come at this with the approach that we've always taken, which is we need to balance affordability for our customers. Keller, you talked about the competitiveness that Governor McMaster expect to see, Secretary 
uh, Lightsey expects to see and that has kept us competitive for many years. That's first and foremost. But balancing that as we always have with reliability, I think at the end of the day, we'll drive towards the right solutions. Yeah, I've got that EPA, the guidelines that just came out and I have it in a folder in my office and I have a, a label on it that says project dark and cold because <laughs> there's no way that we can meet compliance with our coal plants. It is an attempt by the administration and certainly EPA to do away with coal. And you're, 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 you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on the current regulation and you're not getting the first electron out of it. Now we've got this next one and they say be compliant with it and nobody even knows what the rules are. So it's very convoluted. And you know, we've got Myra Reese from DHEC and Nanette Edwards here from ORS and they're gonna be heading up a committee yep. and we're gonna try to come just like following Governor McMaster's lead and try to have comments coming from South Carolina on this. There are other things that you have to go back and take your existing natural gas units and you've got to retro them to be able to burn hydrogen, 100% hydrogen. And we just talked about hydrogen. So, you know, that's, that's your problem. 400 people died in Texas. And when Governor Abbott finished in Texas, he said, we're gonna build natural gas. And that's what they're doing in Texas right now. And thank goodness they're right there on the wells. Thank goodness Governor McMaster has assembled this team here together before somebody in South Carolina perishes as a result of us not having an energy policy. Because if you've ever sat in a call center and you've talked to an elderly couple that's sitting in the dark and they have appliances, life-saving and health monitoring products that are dependent on electricity for them, they're scared to death for their life. And that'll make sure that you focus on that number one priority, safe and reliable power. And so we got to figure this out, but the, where this thing is going, it's everybody in here knows what it is. It's to do away with coal and it's to do away with natural gas and the economy in the United States, much less South Carolina, is not going to survive on that. And people are going to die. Earlier, earlier today, we heard about how do you plan for specific disruption? And you really, the, the comment was made, you can't plan for specific disruption, you can't, but you need dynamic process. Mm -hmm. We talked today about having dynamic internal planning processes. I think it's gonna be critical for us as we look forward from the, that we have dynamic regulatory processes as well that enable us to adjust as the market continues to adjust. If hydrogen becomes a more viable alternative than CCS, how do we, how do we quickly shift our direction um, and the approval process so that we don't have to go back and seek approval for a slightly different plan because new technologies came into place. And Ken, I'll just be, I'll be super quick. Keller, Keller said it, but not how fast we're doing it. Those meetings taking place of us talking about what do these regulations mean, what do they mean financially, what the technologies might mean, happens next week. Yeah. I mean, it's quick. So we as a state have moved relatively quickly and in that special place that I talked a little bit about of it's not just the utilities, it's the policy makers, it's the regulators, it's the advocates, all getting in the same room to talk about what can we do that's in the best interest of South Carolina that tries to meet all the stakeholders' needs or some of their needs. And we have give and takes. And so I just, that's happening quickly and I like that in our state. Well, I wanna thank the four of you for an outstanding session and uh, uh, South Carolina's in good hands with this group, I can tell you right now. And I'm, I'm very proud to be here. Thank you. If there's one question out there that somebody's got to ask, one question, <laughs> I'll entertain it. It's way back over here. Yeah, I'll be nice. Okay, I'm Catherine Fleming Bruce here in Columbia. I just had one question. Um, a couple months ago, Governor McMaster, Congressman Clyburn, um, presented a broadband initiative. And you all mentioned, somebody on the panel there mentioned broadband uh, just a minute ago. So is there any um, sense of collaboration between the energy policy efforts and the broadband policy efforts, any kind of interconnection or, uh, you know, especially since some of the companies that are bringing 
ele- energy are also bringing broadband. San- I, I, quickly, uh, Santi, Santi Cooper, we, our transmission system extends throughout the entirety of the state. And so we just recently opened, essentially opened up our transmission facilities so that we could connect broadband, so we could get it out into the more rural areas of South Carolina. We've also applied, working with the folks at ORS, Nanette Edwards and her team, we've applied for a, a federal grant that would enable us to facilitate and speed up that process so we could make some of the uh, broadband that we have available on our transmission lines um, accessible for folks, pr- again, particularly with a focus on rural areas. And I, w- I would say the co-ops um, individually have stepped up in those underserved areas. And I heard in the net, I don't want to quote the number you said, but it was amazing, right, how fast South Carolina has moved to bring bar- broadband. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we went from 30th broadband to 6th nationally. And it's a little bit of the utilities and the other providers, but in the underserved areas, the co-ops have stepped up and they're moving quickly. And we're excited about that. Thank you for your question. Let's have a hand for this panel. Very good. Very good. Whoop. That's you. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you on behalf of the governor and lieutenant governor for attending this energy summit. Um, I hope you all found it to be beneficial. I hope you all took something away from it. I know I have. I know the governor and lieutenant governor has. Um, and, and I want to just tell you thank you. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you to our panelists who have been up here who have spent their time preparing for this summit and, and hopefully – giving you all something that you didn't have before you walked through the doors today. Um, And also giving you something in the sense that 